I'm Derek Powers back with Chronicle number 52 of the Chronicles of Captivity. I'm Jack Powers, and this is the tale of my federal prison experience of almost 33 years, including nearly 14 years at the ADX Supermax in Florence, Colorado. So we're talking right now about the Supermax, about time in the Supermax. And in Chronicle number 51, if you'll recall, we spoke about how the case manager had taken a hostile attitude and how they were trying to impress upon me that I had nothing coming and um, the futility of even having any hope that you could get a reasonable remedy. They were going to, they wanted me to know they were going to do what they wanted to do. And there was nothing that I could do about it. Um, so I said in this chronicle, I'll tell you about some of the guys because this guy Joker from the cell next door had me blow out the sink and, um, he got a little bit like, I wasn't used to that kind of stuff because in the old days, if you were going to do something to someone, you didn't talk about it. You didn't say, you know, you didn't threaten them or give them any indication. If anything, you went the other way, right? You rocked them to sleep and, and went at it that way. I mean, that was the old days. So, you know, that's what I expected from these guys, but there, and looking back on it, it makes sense. They had to take a little change up in their strategies. And quite frankly, they were not happy to see me come into the control unit at all. And this was part of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Um, part of their retaliatory gesture was to put me in the very place where the other uh, people who wanted to see me dead were all around me. So I was telling you about the orderlies and how we would pass stuff. Well, I'm in this end cell on C range in the control unit. It's upstairs. I think it's 213 if I'm not mistaken uh, I'd, I'd probably bet a thousand dollars if I had a thousand dollars that it was 213 anyway um, I'm in this corner this corner cell this end cell toward the front but on this side and there's an orderly they let him out from one of the cells on the other side of the range and he comes around and you know, he starts talking, we start talking a little bit, and he's kind of a tall guy, maybe about 210, 215, kind of, you know, kind of, kind of a big guy, tall, about 215. And so we started talking, and come to find out, he was the brother of another guy that I'd been in Leavenworth with that was my next door neighbor over there. And these two brothers, they were from Missouri and they were bank robbers. But what they had done, they had gone to this local bank and they kidnapped the bank manager. I think it was out on a weekend, I'm not sure. I don't remember the details exact, so don't come back at me saying, oh, you got this wrong. because. The, the main facts are, are true. They kidnapped the bank manager. They made him open the safe. It's probably on a time lock. They probably had to wait and then have him open it. Then they put him in the back of a pickup truck and they drove over this bridge, this bridge that went over the river, and they just threw him out of the back of the pickup truck. He was tied, taped. Uh, there's nothing he could do but drown. They threw him off the bridge. Um, just, 
you know, just one of those really kind of, not kind of, but really senseless acts because it's just, it's an act of just stupidity, really. And, and that's the way I had felt. I had done some legal work for his brother at Leavenworth way back in the day. So, you know, he was, you know, we had something to talk about, but at the same time, this guy, and he's facing a murder charge for killing another prisoner already. So he's out as the orderly. And I've already noticed that sometimes the doors will open. Just like all of them, most of them, all at the same time. So if you're out, one, well, this actually happened. One day I was in the Sally Port because it was a cleaning day. I'm cleaning my Sally Port area and the outer door to my cell opens. Not only my cell, but about three or four other cells right next to mine. They open for about 10 seconds. I even stepped out in the hall and looked both ways. I didn't step out. I just poked, poked my head out and look both ways, and there were the officers down there. Hey, close those cells, close those cells. But stuff like that happened. It happened, whether it was purposeful or whether it was accidental, who knows? But it, it, it stuff like that happened. And, um, you know, anybody that knows that kind of an environment, you know that those dudes that are in there, they're not in there for being late to Sunday school. These are some, these are some diehard wannabe badasses or badass convicts, right? They, they have this image of themselves and they feel they have to uphold it or even do better than that. And, um, you know, they're definitely of a class or a category in and of itself. But yeah, I mean, they're not gonna, they're not, they're not playing games is what I'm saying. They know how to make knives. They know how to hide weapons, not just a knife, but a weapon. I mean, there's been instances like at Lewisburg where guys will be wrecking together, right? They'll put three guys in the cell and they're all getting along and playing handball and having a bunch of fun. And then all of a sudden, one day, two of them jumps to one. I mean, the one goes up, puts the other guy in a chokehold, and they end up stomping on this dude's head. I mean, stomping and jumping up with their with their brogans, with their federal issue boots, and coming down on his face. They crushed his orbital bones. They smashed his whole face in. They tried, they tried to kill him. They tried to stomp him out. He lost his eye. It's all messed up. All fucked up. I mean, his whole, his whole shit had multiple operations, trying to put it back together. I mean, this stuff happens, and it's real. So, but they had even like, here's how they started out. It was the orderly, and and I forget his name. He's a younger brother of. You know, two brothers who dumped this bank manager off the back of their pickup truck into the, I don't think it was a Chattahoochee, but it was, it was some river in Missouri. Um, and they just threw him off of there. And so they got caught, they got prosecuted, they got convicted, and they got natural life sentences. So the younger one evidently went to and the younger one was a genuine, they were both badasses, right? The older brother told me one day at Leavenworth, I went in cell, I was kicking it with him. And he said, look, if I have a problem with someone, because he worked at Unicor and he was having a little bit of a problem with this dude uh, over there. He said, if I have a problem with someone and I lose a night's sleep because of it, or most of the night's sleep, then the next day, I'm going and I'm taking care of it, one way or the other. 
because I'm not going to lose another night's sleep. And that always stuck with me too, right? Because it was like, man, eh, makes sense. I mean, why, you know, if, if the shit's going to go down, might as well, might as well get to it. I mean, if it, if it's going to anyway, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he, he was, he was a cool dude. And his younger brother was, uh, just, uh, I guess he felt like, hey, I've already thrown my life away and now it doesn't matter. And I want to go to death row. So he was on his way. No, he was on his way to death row for the, I think for the murder of the, of the bank manager. I'm pretty sure. I think his, maybe, maybe his brother had gotten the life sentence and he had gotten the death penalty. I'm not sure of the facts there, but his brother was doing life and either he was doing life and, and killed other prisoners. Uh, but I think he got the death penalty in Missouri and they were going to, um, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how that worked, actually. He, he might have had the federal death penalty out of Missouri. And, you know, that would put him at Terre Haute on death row. But back then, this is 2001, 2002, he was there at the ADX. So the first thing he did was he just rolled down with his dirty mop bucket and he just, like, made like he accidentally spilled it. But it all went under my door. That's before we had those things out in the bottom of the door. And when I went to look at it, it was, you know, it was like feces in this real brackish water. It wasn't a lot of feces, but it was enough to tell that it was feces, right? So it's all in my cell, my cell port and my cell. But I'm thinking, what is this stuff? Really? I mean, is this just, I mean, if that's the best I could do, I would just let it go. I would just leave it alone. I wouldn't even worry about it because it was kind of, you know, that stuff in my mind anyway, it's kind of weak, but um, evidently that's what their new dynamic was, was to try to get at you any way they could. Now that same guy, the same dude, he came back another time. And, you know, I just clean that stuff up. I, you have to, right? Clean it up the best you can. Use soap, use a towel, you know, you just put the towel in the toilet, soap it up. Just, you know, go at the floor and everything. Just try to get it all down the drain. Was it, wasn't that big of a deal. But one time he came back, like about, I think it was two weeks later, and he tried to roll some kind of a, it looked like it was something that was lit. It, I guess it was some kind of a, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but... I saw it down under the door. He was trying to he was trying to jam it with the mop stick. He was hitting really hard with the mop stick against the door. Boom, boom, trying to jam it under there, and it was some kind of a uh, some kind of like a, a toilet paper roll, but it had like some kind of a fuse coming out. It was made of like I don't know some kind of strips of sheet or something. It was on fire, you know. It was burning down. And he was trying to shove it under the door. And then he couldn't get it under the door. And he started stomping on it. And then I guess he picked it up and just booked. Um, I don't know if it was a bomb, a homemade bomb, or some kind of smoke grenade. or uh, I don't know what it was. Whether it was fake. Uh, I don't know. It was just bizarre. So, yeah. I mean, people just get there and they seem to flip out. They seem to just, 
I mean, the feeling in that place is one of despair. It's, I would say it's tantamount maybe to the Middle Ages when maybe they grab somebody up, arrest them, put them in chains and throw them into a, a dungeon or some, you know, some room in one of the arms of the castle, one of the, um, you know, corners or, or basement rooms. Yeah, I think, I think that's kind of the same kind of despair you'd feel. Fellow human beings having actually physically taken control of you, captured you, put you into chains, pointed guns in your face, took you to a cage, locked you in that cage, made you go through a process that dehumanized you or attempted to, right? To me, this whole shit was just, it was, it was like, what sense does this make? I couldn't figure it out. I kept saying to myself, I've never, I've never put anyone in chain. I never put a gun in somebody's face and made them lay down on the ground or, or put their hands behind their back so I could put chains on them, handcuffs and belly chains and black boxes and leg irons and double lock and triple lock. And, I mean, and then put them in a cage and keep them there for years and years and years. out, there has to be a rational relationship between the crime and the punishment. And that can be, I think, a little better determined by whether or not the person, the so-called victim, if there was a personal victim, was injured in some substantial way. In other words, is it a violent crime? Is it where someone intentionally inflicted a sharp degree of violence upon another person intentionally, then, yeah, I think that's where the break has to be made. That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Because with anything less, you have no rational basis for the length or degree of punishment. They really haven't zeroed in on that stuff yet, like really gotten down to brass tacks with the degree, because the degree of punishment is also, um, it's important. It's at least as important as a length. So, I mean, there it is. Criminology. We'll call it 301. Yeah, it was, it was not a pleasant place, and I didn't like the there. So, I'll see you again soon. Uh, come back again, Chronicle 53, coming up 